Welcome back to the show. I'm so excited that you are here. We had an amazing guest on last week talking about oral health in our kids. And she and I could talk about so many things. Um, but there's some, I mean, there's not this handout. There's not this book given to you when you have kids. It's like, hey, start taking to them the, to the dentist around here. Here's things to avoid. Here's things to do. Like, we're all just trying to figure this out for ourselves. And then we have these moments where it's like, well, crap, I haven't been doing it that. Like, I had no idea. And now I have to try to backtrack and like make sure everything's okay. But that's not, the point is not trying to back backpedal, right? The point is just doing what we can and learning and moving forward and not beating ourselves up on what we did before because um, we're all just learning. And again, there's not like this manual. And even if there was, a manual is not a one size fits all. It's what works for you, your family, your intuition. And that is a huge, huge piece of this. So, um, but last week we dove into oral health for kids and it was a really, really great episode. If you are watching this on YouTube, you see my double microphone situation here. Um, one is for the audio and the other one's for the video. Um, and this is the way that I found that it just kind of works both to get the clearest audio on each, each one of those. Um, so since it is Cesarean Awareness Month, I'm going to be doing a solo episode today on the top two reasons that cesareans happen in the United States. And I'm also going to be um, just kind of sharing ways that you can, like taking in this information, things that you can do to potentially prevent having a cesarean. Um, and I'm not going to get into VBAC, but I'm going to link the episodes to our VBAC episodes uh, because 80 or 70 to 80 percent, maybe even higher to 90 percent are eligible for VBACs in our country, but like 10 percent are having them. So there's a huge, huge discrepancy in the VBAC um, information and how it's being translated to you from your provider. Um, and one of the things that people aren't taking into consideration is your family size. So let's say you have a cesarean for your first birth. Instead of giving the option of a VBAC for your second, just scheduling you for another cesarean could potentially impact your chances of family planning of how many kids you can have because each time you have a cesarean, different risks go up. So it's so important to have this information and to start forcing change because our rates are extremely high versus what they should be according to the World Health Organization and versus what they should be according to other practices like midwife's practice and birth center practice. Um, a lot of times people are saying, oh, well, if you're high risk, you're not going to a birthing center. But also birthing centers are taking on patients that OBs would maybe say you're high risk and push other interventions on you. And they're not pushing that on these clients. So let's take into consideration women that have a higher BMI, women that have gestational diabetes. Um, these women are way more likely to be induced and are way more likely to have cesareans. Well, these exact same patients under the care of a midwife, the C-section rate decreases, birth satisfaction increases. So what OBs are considering in the hospital as high risk and trying to control and induce and end up having cesareans with, we're getting different outcomes with midwifery groups, whether it's at home or in a birthing center. There is also that hospital that Dr. K shared on the podcast a few weeks ago in Colorado, a community hospital that did four things, that implemented four things to change their cesarean rate. All right, so I'm going to read this information to you. Um, there are four things that the hospital in Col a community hospital in Colorado did that changed their cesarean rate within one year. So their cesarean rate was already, I want to say it was like 25-ish percent or 27, which is below the national average. But they implemented these four things and their cesarean rate dropped down to 12%, which actually falls within the World Health Organization guidelines. So what four things did they do? One, they stopped elective inductions before 41 weeks of pregnancy. 
This is huge because OBs across the country right now are going off of the ARRIVE trial. They're quoting the ARRIVE trial to everybody saying, but the ARRIVE trial says that if we induce you at 39 weeks, you are less likely to have a cesarean. That trial does not translate into actual life. The numbers achieved in this trial were drastically lower than the national average. So they went, I think it was um, like 23% of non-induced people were having inductions. And the ones that they did induce, it was a 19% cesarean rate. So 19 and 23% are already way over 10% less than the national average. So the numbers that they are achieving in this trial <clears throat> overall is not what's being implemented. So the ways that they were inducing and what they were doing to prevent cesarean in this trial because they knew they were being observed affected their numbers. That's not how people are practicing right now. They're not recreating this trial because they're not being held accountable for the cesarean rates that are happening. Um, so that is a big discrepancy with the ARRIVE trial. But this shows that stopping elective inductions before 41 weeks of pregnancy actually reduces the chances of cesareans. What else did they do? They stopped admitting moms for labor if the um, cervix dilation was less than four centimeters. So they wouldn't let you check into the hospital or admit you until you're at least four centimeters dilated. And I can see a one problem with this, and that is maybe you don't want to have cervical exams in labor. Uh, and that is your right to choose, but it can also give you great information. So you can get there and let's say you are two centimeters, then they're like, go home, labor more, because the sooner you get to the hospital, then the sooner interventions are introduced. So when you're checking into the hospital and you're only two centimeters dilated, and then six hours later, you're three centimeters dilated, they're like, okay, let's go ahead and start you on Pitocin versus waiting until you are that four centimeters dilated uh, and your labor might be going a little bit more steadily, less interventions are bound to happen. Um, so the negative is you might not want cervical exams. So if you're refusing them, you might not know how far along you are. Um, however, if this is your second, third, fourth birth, um, it's less likely that you're not going to have that intuition and really know where you're at. When it's your first time labor, you have no idea. Like I remember with my first my biggest fear, I'm like, my biggest fear as a birthing doula is that I'm going to get to the birthing center and be two centimeters dilated. Like, I'm going to be like, okay, I need to go. Things are picking up and I'm going to get there and it's going to be two centimeters dilated. Or that I'm going to think I got it handled and I'm going to have a car baby. I went into labor, got to the hospital. I was two centimeters dilated. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, it happened because even though I studied birth, I knew it, you don't know how it's going to feel in your body. So especially for first-time moms, that can be really, really tough. When it's your second, third, you know, subsequent babies, then you kind of have a better gauge, especially on how labor feels for you, even though each one can be completely different. Um, you know when things are moving along. But not admitting people before four centimeters shows that you're less likely to have a cesarean. So the third thing is that they taught the staff intermittent auscultation and increased its use um, throughout labor and birth. So this means instead of being continually strapped to electronic fetal monitoring monitors and being continually monitored throughout your labor, they were intermittently checking you um, the heart rate, the intermittently checking the fetal heart rate with contractions. So this is the second reason that our cesarean rate is so high. The second leading cause of cesareans in the United States is non-reassuring fetal heart tones. So being continually strapped to a monitor actually increases your chance of cesarean because Providers aren't in agreement on what fetal heart tones to be looking for. So when they're continually watching you and they're seeing any little dip or anything unreassuring, 
they're intervening versus knowing that variables are normal and that it isn't a black or white. And so that can be hard. Um, but research does not support this. So research shows that intermittent monitoring, so using um, the intermittent auscultation actually decreases cesarean rates and it's not causing any more fetal harm. So the, the thinking behind continual monitoring is we don't want anything to happen to the baby. However, once they started intervening more, the, the C-section rate was increasing, but there was not better fetal outcomes. Not more babies were being saved. Um, but also the induction before 41 weeks usually involves Pitocin, and that contributes to a lot of fetal heart tones um, dropping. So that, that contributes to fetal distress. So letting your body be further along and your baby being more ready to be born is going to have an impact on that. The last thing that this hospital did was report individual physician primary cesarean rates monthly. So each physician was held personally responsible for their own cesarean rates. So then it became kind of a competition. The, the OBs each month when it's reported and you have this really high number, they're like, oh snap, like I better watch that. So most OBs across the board have zero idea what their personal cesarean number is. So that's why this was so groundbreaking in this hospital, because once they were being held accountable, they were able to decrease it. And guess what? The moms were still healthy. It wasn't like these, these cesareans were completely necessary because we know at least two thirds of them happening in the United States are not. So 63, 66% of the cesareans happening are not necessary in the United States. So these four things being implemented were huge in making this change. So how can we take this information and apply it to our own personal birthing um, situations? Uh, before I dive into that, we are going to hear from Jenny Kane. So the number one reason for cesareans in the United States is failure to progress, which honestly is a trash diagnosis. It's been so debunked on many, many levels, and it's very rare that that's a true, a true diagnosis. Um, and let's, let's talk about what's causing it. So as this hospital in Colorado, they stopped inducing before 41 weeks. That is huge because when we're inducing before your baby's ready, when we're inducing um, that much more prematurely, like 41 weeks versus 39 weeks, those extra two weeks in utero are huge. And we're not taking that into consideration. So when you're forcing the baby out before they're ready, we're using Pitocin. We're trying to force the baby into into coming out your body into labor before it's ready. And then we're failing to progress because we're upping the Pitocin and we're stalling out in labor. We're, um, you know, getting an epidural, which can slow down your labor. We're doing all these things to try to get the baby out. And once we start that induction, you're not leaving the hospital. People aren't like, okay, let me try this. Let me try the balloon. And if I don't go into labor, then I'm going to go home. No, they're exhausting every single resource until they're getting that baby out. And so that failure to progress is you're simply your body not being ready to have a baby and you're kind of forcing it out. And so that leads to our number one C-section rate. Um, and evidence does not support inducing for due dates. It does not support inducing um, for big babies. There's a lot of lot of things that providers will try to scare you into or say that isn't necessarily true or backed by evidence. Because we are seeing when people are like, oh, well, if you go past your due date, your baby could die. You might have a stillbirth. You might have X, Y, and Z. 
although there is risk to every single decision that we make, the chance of that happening is not super high, but the chance of you ending in a cesarean or having an adverse outcome because of the use of Pitocin is way, way higher than the chance of anything like that happening. We all know people who different things have happened to, but that doesn't mean that it's going to necessarily happen to you. Um, it means that you need to be equipped and that you need to have the information because a lot of bad things that are happening are actually caused by the medical system. They're trying to control everything. So they're introducing different interventions and people are like, oh, well, they saved my baby, but they also most likely caused the problem that we needed to get your baby out immediately from. It can be really hard information to hear because none of us want to necessarily think that way, but if you've been listening to this podcast for a long time, you hear the interviews that are done where this information is coming up over and over. And I'm going to reference that episode with Dr. K again, because she is a high risk OBGYN and she was verifying all of this. She's like, this is true. Like midwifery care is better for most people because they're having way better outcomes. She agreed that we're intervening way too much. She agreed that um, we're not giving women enough autonomy over their bodies and decisions over their births and just letting labor be undisturbed. And she said she sees the best outcomes with her patients, her high risk patients, even when they do that. And she shared what actually constitutes as high risks. And it's these pre existing conditions um, that genuinely really need monitoring during labor and birth. As I mentioned before, the number two reason for inductions in, or not inductions for cesareans in our country is the unreassuring fetal heart tones. So the continually monitoring versus intermittent is huge. So this is something to definitely include in your birthing plan. If you are planning your birth right now and you want to try to have a vaginal delivery, talking to your provider about induction, about due dates, um, about what do they consider a failure to progress? What does your provider consider a failure to progress? Um, how do they want your labor to move along versus you just letting your labor move along uh, is so, so important. And talking to them about intermittent monitoring versus continual monitoring. Uh, there are a few things to take into consideration. So let's say we know now that continual monitoring leads to higher cesarean rates. So you don't want that. However, if you get induced, they have to monitor the baby. They need to make sure that the baby's responding okay um, to the induction. If you have an epidural, you have to be monitored. They want to make sure, again, baby's responding okay. So as soon as you introduce any intervention, any medication or drug or anything like that, baby needs to be monitored um, because you want to make sure that the baby's handling everything okay. So you can't necessarily have these coincide with each other. You can't say, I want intermittent monitoring, but I also want an epidural. You can get intermittent monitoring until you decide to get an epidural. Um, but having this information to make these decisions is so, so important. I do want to talk about one more thing on the failure to progress that I forgot to mention. And that is that providers are still going off of Friedman's curve, which is from the 1950s. And this guy did a study of 500 Caucasian females, young women in his hospital and tried to see their length of labor and how often they were dilating and at like what time intervals and basically said, this is how labor should go. So this is 70 years old and providers are still going off of this, which didn't include any diversity. It didn't include higher ages, different races, um, different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, this study was not done very well and has a lot, a lot of holes in it. And so he created this thing called Friedman's Curve and says, this is how labor should progress that is the guidelines that obstetricians are still using today to measure how labor should progress. And there are so many differences today as well um, than there was 70 years ago. I mean, even our health is different. We're having babies later. We're actually 
um, managing pain differently. We're inducing differently. There are so many different things that are happening, but yet that's not taken in consideration, but you're supposed to have this perfect curve of how your labor should progress. And that's just not necessarily true. Labor is not linear. We all experience it very, very differently. You could be four centimeters walking around for weeks and go into labor and have your baby an hour later. <laughs> you could be zero dilated and have your baby an hour later. You can be four centimeters dilated and have your baby 16 hours later, 20 hours later. Like there isn't a perfect bell curve that we all should fit into. Labor and birth is so different. Mom and, moms and babies are so different. Our needs are different. The environment that you're birthing in is different. Um, the interventions that are in your birth are different. All these different things are going to affect your labor and the course that it's taking, the length that it's taking. Uh, and so the fact that we are being measured on this curve from 70 years ago is absolutely insane. Oftentimes failure to progress is also just failure to wait for your body. So if you're in this situation and your provider's like, hey, you've been six centimeters for nine hours, you know, let's, I think it's time to do a cesarean. The first question is, how's baby doing? Baby's tolerating everything okay? Okay, great. Why don't we take a break? What it, what happens if we like unhook from the Pitocin? What happens if we unhook from everything, let my body chill for a minute, and then maybe try something different? Um, you have to know how to completely exhaust your resources. What about position changing? Uh, even with an epidural, there are so many different positions that you can do that are beneficial to baby that help move baby down. Um, so trying out different laboring positions, using a pump to get things going. There are so many different things that you can do instead of just automatically resorting to the cesarean. For non-reassuring heart tones, fetal heart tones, it sounds so scary because you're having a provider coming in saying the baby's heart rate's dropping, we need to get them out. And we don't know what to look for on um, you know, the machine that's showing their heart rate. And so it can sound super, super scary, but it's also another place that it's really important to know your options in. Um, so even asking the question, hey, is it okay if we wait a little bit? Is it okay if we change positions and see how baby tolerates that position change? What, what if we turn, again, turn off the Pitocin and see how baby reacts to that? Because Pitocin is a leading cause of fetal distress in labor and birth. Um, so knowing your different options and being able to present these in the moment is going to be really, really vital to having a provider, um, give you that space and potentially preventing an unnecessary cesarean from happening. Another, another thing that you can do is ask your provider if they know their cesarean rate, find out your hospital cesarean rate, find out the practices cesarean rate. The problem is not all of this information is readily available. So digging for it could be tough, but uh, if you can find it, that'd be great. There are some hospitals that have extremely high cesarean rates. So maybe that's not where you want to birth. Or if you don't have a choice but to birth there, knowing what you're dealing with and going in equipped and with the information um, that you need to to really advocate for yourself is really important. I also know before we wrap up this podcast, I, I feel like I have to say it and I say it every single time we talk about cesareans because it's such a touchy subject and like all of us are so emotionally tied to our births and we are emotionally tied to our decisions in motherhood. And I think that it's it can be so triggering talking about this, or maybe if you've had a prior cesarean, hearing this information might bring up some stuff for you. Cesareans save lives a thousand percent. They are so important and they do help provide us with healthy moms and healthy babies and save lives. When I am presenting research, this isn't an at you. I'm not coming at anybody. I'm simply presenting what the data and the research and what we know to be true is. 
Even the World Health Organization says our cesarean rate should be 10 to 15%. Ours is 33 to 34. So 20% more than it should be. Again, meaning that two-thirds of the cesareans happening should not be happening and that the hospital and the providers are causing this more by failure to progress, by unreassuring fetal heart tones, by unnecessary inter, uh, inter um inductions and interventions. So this is what the research is showing us. And I am equipping you because I genuinely love birth and I'm so passionate about it. And I, I love motherhood and cesareans are not easy. That recovery is not easy. And repeat cesareans are risky, way more risky than a VBAC. And I don't understand why providers are not offering more VBACs. Actually I do. It's litigation. It's insurance. It's all sorts of non-valid reasons. Um, it's valid reasons to protect them, but not to protect you. Um, way more negative effects are happening from repeat cesareans. So that's why this information is so important to get out there. And that that's why I share it. It's not to shame anybody for their decisions. It's not to to shame anybody for things they wish they would have done differently. Um, it's just because this is what the research shows and what we can actually go off of from what other countries are doing, what other hospitals are doing, what other providers are doing, what midwives are doing and what the research shows that we should be doing. So, um, that's why I'm presenting this because it is so, so, so important. Um, and I'm not anti-cesarean. Um, go back and listen to Dr. Maggie Hill's episode from two weeks ago. She shares her home birth transfer, transfer turn cesarean. And, um, and I thought it was such a great episode. Like I loved hearing her story. And I think that it's important to hear those stories because we need to know what does happen in cesareans. We need to prepare ourselves for if that happens because it is happening a lot. And in her case, she needed one and she had peace about it and she ended up transferring to the hospital then ended up deciding on a cesarean and she had peace about it um the providers were telling her she should and she had the information she did a ton of research she prepared herself fully and then made that decision at the time because it was what was best for her and her baby that's simply not what's happening in a lot of these births People aren't educating themselves and knowing the research and the alternatives and what to ask their providers and what to push for and how to advocate. And so it's just happening to you. And I don't want you to be another statistic. I want you to know this information, to know the research, to know to how to advocate for yourself and your birth, the questions to ask your providers, how to look for a new one, or how to simply say no and be comfortable with your decisions. So make sure you're staying tuned in to the podcast to hear more information. Follow me on Instagram at eSandos. Um, I will be linking that episode with Dr. K, uh, and I will be linking Maggie's episode as well and the VBAC episodes so that you can go back and listen to those to get more information. I hope you enjoyed this solo episode. At the beginning, I know that I said, I have two microphones, one's for the audio, one's for the video. And then halfway through, I realized that I forgot to hit play on the audio one. So if the audio, if you're just listening to it and not watching it, if the audio sounds a little bit weird this week, it's because I did not hit play on my audio recorder. So sorry about that. But you can watch the YouTube video. It'll make a little bit more sense because you can see my face when I'm talking and the audio might sound a little bit better. All right, have a good week and we will talk to you next week.